Our fall sermon series continues this morning. The title of the series, I hope you will recall, is Who Do You Say That I Am? It is a question that Jesus asked his disciples long ago. It is a question that Jesus asks each of these disciples today. And today, in our sermon, our answer to the question is Jesus, the one who seeks. Listen now to God's word to us as it comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, you may do so on page 854. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The word of the Lord. A number of years ago, Lena Williams wrote a short story entitled Personal Testimony. Personal Testimony. It's about a 12-year-old girl, the daughter of a fire-breathing West Texas preacher, and every summer, this girl is compelled by her father to go to a fundamentalist Bible camp for a couple of weeks. Now, during the day, this camp is like most other camps for kids. There's hiking and sailing, softball, arts and crafts. But at night, at night, every night, there is a sweaty come-to-Jesus revival meeting. And the unwritten rule at, is that every camper will, at some point during their stay, come forward during this meeting and give his or her personal testimony. The reality, of course, is that many of these campers are just normal kids. They don't really have personal testimonies. And that's where our 12-year-old preacher's daughter comes into play. See, she's figured out a way to make some extra money at this camp. As a ghost rider for Jesus. She fabricates personal testimonies for the other campers. For $5, she wrote one for Michael which he delivered, tears coming down his face about how in his old life he used to take the Lord's name in vain at football games, but now his mouth is as pure as a crystal spring. Her most dramatic work, though, was for Tim. Tim recalled how his life was empty and meaningless until the near accident. Late at night, in a pickup truck, he was sure he was a goner until Jesus took the steering wheel and turned the vehicle away from danger. That required a little more imagination, so she charged $25. It is, of course, a made-up story, but the paradigm is one we recognize, right? Old life, new life. Once lost, now found. And please do not misunderstand, I am not making fun of this paradigm in any way. In fact, the gospel writer Luke loves this paradigm. If you were to go back to the 15th chapter of Luke, Jesus tells three parables. Three parables, very important, I think, for our text for today. 
If any of you are visual people and would like to, in fact, go back in your pew Bibles to those three parables, you can find them on page 850 in your pew Bibles. Those three parables in chapter 15 are the story of the lost sheep, the story of the lost coin, and the story of the lost or prodigal son. And you may recall that Luke is also the author of the book of Acts, and in Acts, who is the main or one of the main characters there? It's the Apostle Paul, who once was Saul, who once was persecuting the church, but then, by God's grace, becomes a missionary for the church. Do you see the paradigm? Old life, new life, once lost, now found. And so we have another example in Luke of this paradigm. It's in our text for today. Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. He's talking, of course, about Zacchaeus, a tax collector. Don't think IRS when you hear the words tax collector. Remember, tax collectors were despised people in Jesus' day. They were accused of lining their pockets with money that was collected from their own people to give to the Romans, the enemy. And Zacchaeus wasn't just any old tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. And in addition to that, he was rich. You'll recall that just a couple chapters earlier, chapter 17, there was another story, Luke tells, about a man who was rich, the rich ruler, who comes to Jesus and asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus says, you lack one thing, go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And how does that rich ruler respond? <laughs> With sadness, because he's lost in his possessions. So, if anyone would be considered lost in Jesus' day, it would be Zacchaeus. And you know the story. Zacchaeus was curious about Jesus, wanted to see Jesus, so he climbs a tree to get a better view of Jesus. Jesus spots Zacchaeus up in that tree. He calls Zacchaeus down. Zacchaeus rushes down and is happy to welcome Jesus. And then Zacchaeus pledges half of what he owns to the poor. Jesus proclaims, salvation has come to this house. It all fits the paradigm, right? The one who was lost in his wayward life, Zacchaeus, has now been found by Jesus and straightened his life out because of Jesus. That's how we're supposed to hear the story, right? Hmm. There's just one problem. Do you know what Zacchaeus means? It means innocent. It means clean. Zacchaeus did not receive his name after Jesus found him. It was always his name. Which got me thinking, what if Luke is trying to tell us something with this name? What if Zacchaeus was innocent all along? What if he wasn't lining his pockets with money taken from his own people? What if he was just an honest guy in a lousy and morally ambiguous profession and he was making a living the best way he knew how? <laughs> if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. That's what he says, but it does not have to be a proclamation of guilt. It could also be the pledge of an innocent person. I've never done such a thing. Defraud someone? If you find out I did that, I'll pay back four times. So how are we supposed to hear this story about Zacchaeus, about the innocent one? Well, let's take one more look at those three parables in Luke chapter 15. I know we didn't read them, but you remember them, right? Lost sheep. Lost coin, lost son. I think, I think those three parables are giving us different ways, different explanations for how someone can be lost. Think about it. How does a sheep get lost? How does a sheep get lost? 
just kind of a wandering away from the other sheep, right? The sheep didn't decide to go out and have a party. The sheep just, you know, wandered away on its own, just being a sheep. How does a coin get lost? A coin doesn't get lost by making a decision. A coin is lost when it's misplaced. A coin is innocent, if you will, if I can put it that way. I wonder if, I wonder if we've got something like that with Zacchaeus. Imagine that you are Zacchaeus, and even though you're honest, your profession has a terrible reputation, but you cannot get out of what you do. You're trapped by the Romans. They're telling you this is what you will do. You're trapped by the system. It's got you in its grip. Your work, well, it's the way you put food on the table, and what does that get you? It keeps you alive but you're not really living. No one accepts you, no one likes you, no one wants to be your friend. You've got all the money you could ever hope for, but money will not fill that hole that's in your heart if you're Zacchaeus, that empty place that craves a community that will welcome you. And then Jesus comes along, and you've heard about Jesus, and you really want to see Jesus, so you climb up a tree. Think about that image for a moment. Zacchaeus up in a tree, apart once again from his community. And Jesus sees you and calls you and says in front of everyone else, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. And when Jesus says that, you hear the words you have been dying to hear. Not just that Jesus is staying with you. You hear, you are accepted. You are welcomed. You are loved. You are part of God's family. This one too is a son of Abraham, Jesus says. And that hole in Zacchaeus' heart suddenly starts to heal. And he no longer sees himself as lost. He no longer feels lost. He no longer is lost because Jesus has found him. I wonder if that's a fourth way in Luke that a person can be lost and found. You've got a hole in your heart and Jesus finds you. And then that hole starts to heal and that healing leads to great joy. In 2016, an Oscar-nominated movie appeared based on a true story about a boy who was lost in India. Saru Briarly is the boy's name. He and his siblings were being raised by their mother. Their family was very poor. He was five years old when he and his brother went to a train station to scavenge for coins for their home. Saru fell asleep on a bench at the train station. His brother left Saru to go look around. When Saru woke up, he did not see his brother, and he panicked. He climbed aboard a train close to the bench, figuring his brother was there. His brother was not on the train, but Saru realizes this too late. The train has already left the station, and it takes five-year-old Saru all the way to Calcutta almost 1,000 miles away from his home. Saru was illiterate, which meant he mispronounced the name of his hometown, and the people of Calcutta were, they spoke a different language than Saru, all of which meant that there was no way for him to clearly communicate where he was from. He was lost, five years old, through no fault of his own, lost, roaming the streets. Eventually, Saru gets picked up and placed in an orphanage, and a couple from Australia adopt him. Saru spends the next 25 years of his life growing up there, going to school, but he never forgets his home in India. And one day, as an adult, Saru discovers Google Earth. Over the course of six years, he sets about trying to find his original home using Google Earth. Imagine that. Six years, 
looking for a tiny village, not knowing the village's real name in a country as huge as India. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. But one day, he sees something that matches his memory from when he was five. The closer he looks, the more certain he is that against all odds, he has found his Indian home. So he travels from Australia to India and in the movie. The final scene shows Saru asking around the village, being pointed in the direction of his mother's place, walking down the road. And then a woman at the end of the road starts walking toward him. <laughs> Imagine that moment. It's his mother. Saru has not seen his birth mother for 25 years, but now he sees her. His mother did not know what happened to her boy for a quarter century. She fears that he is dead, but she's never given up hope. And now she sees him again as a grown man. <laughs> Can you picture what it's like to be that mother and that son at that moment? Can you picture the hole in that mother's heart being healed? Can you picture the joy of what's lost being found? You see, it is the joy, the joy that captures my imagination in our text for today. The joy that prompts Zacchaeus to give half of what he has away. In fact, if we go back to Luke 15 one more time, how do each of those parables of lost and found end? You know how they end. They end in joy. The one who finds his lost sheep wants to celebrate. The woman who finds her lost coin wants to celebrate. The father who gets his son back throws a party. And here today we have Zacchaeus pledging to give half of his possessions to the poor. Have you ever known that kind of joy in your life before? Let me get at it like this. If there are different ways of being lost, according to Luke, the sheep lost just by being a sheep, the coin lost by no fault of its own, Zacchaeus lost because his community wants to see him one way, and that's not really who he is. All of it makes me wonder, when have you been lost? It doesn't have to be because of a poor decision or a series of mistakes. Maybe you were lost when a relationship failed, or your job just disappeared, or your dreams for the future were dashed, or a loved one is now gone and you just cannot get your bearings. There are any number of reasons why you and I might find ourselves lost in this or that season of our lives, which is why I think the heart of the gospel is found in this text. Jesus is the one who seeks and saves the lost. Jesus is the one who promises to always come after you. Jesus is the one who says, I will never give up on you. I will always pursue you. No matter where you go, no matter what happens in your life, I will find you and I will help heal that hole in your heart. You see, I believe that being found by Jesus is the real reason all of us are here today. We are a found people, <laughs> and that changes us. It helps us to become more generous, to be more loving, to be more of the person whom God has called us to be. I'm reminded of a story that the late preacher Fred Craddock loved to tell. Once upon a time, it's a once upon a time story, once upon a time there was a family out for a Sunday drive. Suddenly, the two children in the back start to shout, Daddy, Daddy, stop the car, stop the car. There's a kitten over there in the back on the side of the road. The father says, so there's a kitten on the side of the road. We're having a drive. But Daddy, you have to stop and pick it up. 
I don't have to stop and pick it up, but if you don't, it will die. We don't have room for another animal in the house, children. But Daddy, are you just going to let it die? Be quiet, children. We are having a pleasant drive. But Daddy... Finally, the mother turns to her husband and says, Dear, you're going to have to turn around. Well, he turns the car around and returns to the spot. He goes out and picks up the kitten. The poor creature is just skin and bones, sore-eyed, full of fleas. But when he reaches down to pick it up with its, its last bit of energy, the kitten bristles, bearing tooth and claw. The kitchen swipes and scratches the father. Well, he picks up the kitten by the loose skin at the neck and brings it over to the car. When they get back to the house, the children struggle to give the kitten a bath, feed her about a gallon of milk, and then they run to their father. Can we let it stay in the house, Daddy, just for tonight? Sure, take it to my bedroom. Whole house is already an animal shelter. Well, they fix a comfortable bed. One night goes by, two nights go by, Several weeks go by. Then one day, the father walks in and feels something rub against his leg. He looks down, and there is the cat. So he reaches down to pet the cat, carefully making sure no one in his family is watching him do this. And when the cat sees his hand, it does not bear tooth and claw. Instead, it arches its back to receive a caress. Now, is this the same cat? Yes, yes, it's the same cat. No. It is not the same frightened, hurting, lost cat that was on the side of the road. And you know as well as I do what made the difference.